Hello, BookTube. I went to the Brattle Bookshop today. <laughs> I know, you're stunned. <laughs> it's a used bookstore, for those of you who are new to the channel. Uh, it's a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. It's, it's three stories of jam-packed bookshelves, and also a sale lot outdoor. That's $1, $3, and $5 sale books that on all topics under the sun and usually in great condition so that you don't, you're not, you know, buying a piece of junk that's got mildew all over, a page is missing or whatever. And uh, I got a bunch of books. I got a huge amount of books. And once again, I'm only showing you a fraction of them because a chunk of what I got are destined elsewhere. So I don't want to show them on camera in case they're a recipient sees them and spoils a surprise. <laughs> I'm very much in favor of giddy surprises when books are opened. Uh, but that still leads me to a little pile of my own, including a couple of finds. So, uh, and the first one is a mass market paperback. Uh, this is The Big V by William Pelfrey. And it is, uh, Avon Books did uh, uh, about 30 or 40 years ago. When was this? 1980s, I want to say. 1972. So 50 years ago. Uh, Avon Books did a gigantic series of books on Vietnam. Huge. A ton of nonfiction books, ton of uh, novels, all relatively looking this same way, the title on one side, a line, and then the cover art, uh, and all at the same time, just mountains of them. Um, I read a lot of them, uh, mostly the nonfiction. This is a novel I believe about a, a fresh-faced college kid who gets shipped out to Vietnam. What, what do we have here? Drafted fresh out of college, Henry Winstead can't fit the lunacy and clenching fear of Vietnam with his memories of what the war looked like on the 6 o'clock news. Now, in the middle of the real thing, he is staring into the many faces of irrational slaughter. The open stare of friendly villagers who know that a cadre of guerrillas awaits in ambush, the suicidal frenzy of John Wayne's sergeants, tape-recorded taps for a fallen comrade. Uh, I'm all for it. It's not a long thing. It won't take any time at all to do. But all of these Avons look the same way. And naturally, I'm wondering, you know, the way the brattle is, I'm wondering if this is the tip of the iceberg and maybe somebody's getting rid of a lot of these. Uh, I'm not sure, not sure how up I'd be for revisiting a lot of them. But nevertheless, I think this author, I don't know how, how many other novels he ever wrote. His claim to fame, if I remember correctly, is that he wrote the screenplay for the movie Hamburger Hill. Uh, and spent some time in Vietnam himself. So I haven't read a Vietnam novel in quite some time. I'm happy to give it a try. Uh, uh, then this next one is a classic example of the Brattle giving you a second chance at something. I got the advanced copy of this thing, read it, really liked it. Got the finished copy back in 2012, I think it was. So after I got back into book reviewing, but before we were talking with each other every day, uh, and read, the, read it again for the finished copy, loved it, absolutely loved it. I think it was on my year-end list. Uh, for nonfiction, and then, as so often happens, I got rid of it. No idea why, and no idea where. <laughs> but it was the minute I saw it at the Brattle, I realized that I didn't have it, and I very much want it. Uh, this is Paul Ellie. This is reinventing Bach. This is the author of the Life You Save May Be Your Own, which we've seen on this channel, uh, and this is a book about. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, yes, and it is a very, actually very good as a biography of him, but it's also very much about how his music outlived him and where. It's many afterlives, the afterlives of the music of Bach, uh, and how mercurial it is, how it slips around in form and format and location, and how you can't predict it, and how it's a little rare uh, in terms of, of classical music to do that. Uh, he writes at one point here, uh, that Johann Sebastian and Maria Barbara Bach rented an apartment on the market square in Weimar, which put them at the heart of daily life in town. When their first child was born, a daughter, Dorothea, Maria Barbara's unmarried sister joined them there. They would stay for nine years in Weimar, and five children would follow. Three boys, then twins, a boy and a girl who died shortly after birth. Bach played the organ in Lutheran services in the palace chapel and played the clavier to entertain Wilhelm Ernst. He taught other organists, played the organ during services at the church at St. Peter's and Paul, at St. Peter's and Paul, in town, gave recitals there on Sunday afternoons, and examined old organs at surrounding churches to explain how they could be restored. He had gotten a harpsichord as a wedding gift, and it enabled him to make the apartment on the market square a place of music making. All at once, the familiar image of Bach as a professional musician and pater familias is substantially complete. 
With a salary, a patron, an audience, and an instrument of his own, he became a composer, and he began to write the music for which he is known, organ works, cantatas, and instrumental music, suites, concertos, sonatas, partitas, inventions, and minuets simple enough for a child to play. It is true that he settled down at Weimar, but he, he would not be defined by his work there or anywhere else. And that's, that's a, if I remember correctly, that's the whole point of the early part of this book, is that this is a, a slippery figure in a good way. And then the book goes on from there to Albert Schweitzer and, and uh, Pablo Casals and uh, Daniel Barenboim, Itzhak Perlman, uh, Stokowski, and Fantasia, and of course, Glenn Gould who is a big, big character in this book and is written about wonderfully. In fact, better than in any Gould biography that I've read. So I, I don't know why I got rid of this when I, when it's a Bach book that I want to keep. And so when I saw it out in the sale lot, I grabbed it. Uh, same thing with this next one. This next one may be the find of the day. I haven't seen it in a long, long time. Uh, this is Sam Adams' Revolution. Uh, with assistance of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, George III, and the people of Boston. And it's by Cass Canfield, who was, it's a, it's a thin little thing, but it's a great look at Samuel Adams's formative role in causing the American Revolution, in doing the, the background work that isn't quite as fancy as, you know, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere or anything like that, but that was incredibly essential for the whole thing to take root. Long before people were willing to put their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honors on the line in 1776, ten years before then, Samuel Adams was making the rounds at taverns and bookshops, meeting halls of all kinds in Boston, talking to ordinary people about how, look, you know I'm not an alarmist. You know I'm not an extremist at all. I am as mild-mannered a person as lives in this town. But I want to make a case for you of what you, th I think, already know, which is that a break is coming. Something serious is coming. It's not going to be something that we're going to weather. And I want to make the case that it's good. That's a good thing. That it's not unthinkable that we break with, with the mother colony. That it's not unthinkable that we break with England. That it's actually going to be in your benefit to do that. In the long term, if we win. If you don't have somebody making the rounds at those tavern tables turning the groundswell of opinion, you're not going to have any support for a revolution against the crown, especially once the warships start arriving in Boston Harbor and New York Harbor. And let's keep in mind, even with people like Samuel Adams, and he was the best of them all, uh, the support for that idea never really rose much higher than a bare narrow 50%, if that. So it's great that Cass Canfield, you know, late in a career of writing nonstop and being a poobah at Harper and Row, he was a, he was a publishing poobah. Uh, it's great that he wrote books. I wish I had them all, and this is my favorite of them. And it's great that he turned the attention to this to this subject and gave it the emphasis that I that it deserves. I had a copy of this years and years ago uh, that I wish I still had. <laughs> I wish I still had it. It was it was lost in a house fire. Uh, and the reason that I wish I still had it is because he was a friend of mine. Not Samuel Adams, but Cass Canfield was a friend of mine. And he gave me a, that copy of the book. And he wrote this book for, it came out in America's Bicentennial, the Bicentennial of the American Revolution, 1976. Uh, and we were, he was very generous with his time. Uh, and it was, it was a great friendship. Uh, that came, I got a late echo of it when I, years and years, decades later, I got to know the historian Douglas Shantucci, who had been a client of Cass Canfield's, who Cass Canfield had done the stereotypical publisher thing, call, you know, taking a wary 3 a.m. phone call, holding your hand, and giving you a little money here and there, reassuring you that you are a genius, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Douglas didn't know that Cass Canfield and I had been friends and said to me at one point after we had locked horns on his latest piece for Open Letters Monthly that I was his favorite editor since Cass Canfield. And he, he sort of hitched his voice and started to explain who Cass Canfield was. And I, I didn't tell him everything, but I had to stop him and say, please, you don't have to explain who Cass Canfield was. And you have just given me an amazing compliment. And, and it was a great moment. It was a great moment. I, over the over the lunchtime table because Douglas 
knew that I would have to know something of who this man was in order to know what a compliment it was. Uh, so that, that really neat, that made me just smile ear to ear when I saw this, uh, you know, a, a chilly brattle sail lot early in the morning on a Tuesday uh, when both of them are long gone. Uh, and uh, the added benefit is there's a book that I really like. So that's fantastic. That's definitely a keeper. Uh, and then this next one's something that uh, I don't want to make a mistake and say that this author is certainly dead. I've, I, every time I do that in a mail hall or a library tour or whatever, people pipe up. <laughs> I should check Wikipedia first. It's possible that this author is still alive. He's written a lot of books that I really like. Uh, and this I've only read bits of. So uh, it was a find. This is Becoming a Londoner uh, by David Plant. And this is the story of his time. He had dual citizenship with the United States and, and Great Britain and lived for a long time in London with his lover uh, and met everybody, just everybody who was anybody, everybody in the literary world, everybody in the artistic world. He was a, a respected novelist. A lot of his novels have explicitly gay themes and are really good. He wrote a novel called The Catholic that I would argue is his best book and that really... It were, it really is worth reading but uh he's a great diarist these are his, his his london diaries and he is a great diarist now i don't know if he's still alive i i sure that he won't watch this video in any case but one way or another i would lump him in with the, that group of people who are better as diarists than they are at their profession <laughs> i would of course say that andy wall is a better diarist than he was an artist Ned Rohr was a much better diarist than he was a composer. I would I would court disaster on book two by saying that Christopher Isherwood was a much better diarist than he was a novelist. And I would say the same thing about David Plant, who had an amazing experience. This this he has one lover throughout this whole time, a man named Nico. Uh, and it's a particularly it's a particular phenomenon that happens in gay relationships. Uh, gay gay relationships even when they were as as plant says all throughout this diary criminal it was what it, he and nico were doing every day was criminal <laughs> uh sometimes more than every day <laughs> uh when it, at that time when when you know a gay relationship could could not possibly have a genetic component and it also couldn't have a social component when you take those elements out of a a relationship like that, especially a relationship that is going to be known. It's not going to be a complete secret, as he makes clear over and over again in these diaries. Everybody knew that he and Nico were a couple. But if you take those elements out, I have found that sometimes that puts a very unhealthy emphasis on other elements, including physical attractiveness. The, the gay world can be famously merciless when it comes to physical attractiveness. Uh, and use that as a, as a reason to break a relationship. Uh, and it, it's also host to a strange phenomenon. That very factor leads to a strange phenomenon in gay relationships because uh, sometimes you will have a very successful gay relationship, uh, uh, the love of a life that goes on forever. David Plant, at his lover's memorial service, was bawling as though his lover had died in the first weeks of the hottest heat of passion, as opposed to after decades. That's how real this was. Uh, but sometimes, in the, even in those relationships, when they're very real, sometimes one thing you will notice is that one partner will be dramatically better looking than the other. And whether the other is ordinarily good looking or plain or even ugly <laughs> in the middle of the american midwest where all the men are beautiful and above average uh when that happens the less attractive man in the relationship if he's psychologically sound if he's not constantly worrying and insecure will have a weird kind of otherworldly experience to write about uh and that was true in this case that was true for david plant i uh yeah okay <laughs> guess which of those two is our author and which of those two is is nico uh, i don't think it'll take much work <laughs> to guess maybe not some of you are, are uh, some of you heterosexual people may have trouble distinguishing which of those two men is, is is more attractive than the other but one way or another that's an element that runs through the sections of these diaries that i read way back when so i was overjoyed to find this book i will this will be the one even cass canfield will be nudged aside to read a chunk of this or maybe all of it today uh another keeper but the, you know that's the goal with brattle visits is that you want the books to be keepers i'm perfectly happy since these things are cheap 
it from a sale lot. I'm perfectly happy to cycle through them, read them, realize, okay, that was fun, but I don't actually want to keep this, and put it on the discard pile, probably to go back to the brattle. I'm perfectly happy to continue that carbon cycle, but the goal is to get books that you that you love so much that you don't want to get rid of them. And you can say, you can tell already, just in the books that you've seen, that some of these are those. So, uh, this next one, I don't know. Maybe not. It, it's going to be dated. Uh, this is Max Eastman, uh, a, a curious figure in American literary history, publishing history, even political history, because he was a Marxist for a long time and then didn't like the Marxists for a long time. He was actually, when it comes to uh, to Marxism and, and semi-Marxism and all that sort of stuff, he was a roving editor. He was a poobah at Reader's Digest magazine back when it was a big deal. Right now it's it's faded into triviality, like the Saturday Evening Post, but once upon a time it was a big literary thing, Reader's Digest was, and serious readers read it without any embarrassment or irony. And Max Eastman was the was the editor at Reader's Digest that was uh, responsible for serializing Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. It's not Reader's Digest fair even then, but he was irresistible. He was a, a tall, astonishingly handsome Bon vivant of a man, just a, a, an explosive ripple of laughter. Utterly unmistakable. Two rooms away in a six-room Manhattan party, you would know where Max Eastman was and that something had just thought, had just tickled his funny bone, which wasn't hard to do. He was all he was synonymous with laughter to his friends. Uh, he was the subject of a recent biography by Christoph Ermscher uh, that I had the pleasure of reviewing uh, for, I believe, the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, because Eastman spent some time on the vineyard as a nudist, <laughs> but he had many, many aspects to him. And he wrote a long time ago, a hundred years ago, I think, thereabouts. He wrote, it's hard to think, it's hard to think of Max Eastman as old, much less dead. But I believe his first book uh, was the, the en enjoyment of poetry. He wrote, he wrote a book about enjoying poetry and doing it without any airs, without any, without any condescension or anything. And it was a hit, a minor hit, but still a hit. It was, it was something people talked about. It was something that got reviewed. People uh, read it and circulated in libraries and whatnot. And he, they, there followed a long string of books. And uh, decades later, decades after the enjoyment of uh, poetry, he wrote this book, Enjoyment of Laughter. That is our author on the cover. <laughs> that is not a staged photo, to say the least. That is probably had that look on his face when he died. <laughs> but uh, this is a, a book length study of humor, which in almost anybody else's hands would be a, just a recipe for disaster. It would be a doomed from the start. But I don't think I've ever read this book. I've read, he did others. He did, he did not just enjoyment of poetry, but in a. Uh, at least one other enjoyment book along the pattern to recall the name of enjoyment of poetry aside from this one but i don't think i've ever read this one and that's going to make it a joy just <laughs> there's our author in a rare incidence where he was wearing clothes <laughs> probably, the photographer probably had to plead with him but this thing is full of uh artwork a lot of it from the new yorker uh, that's james thurber but lots of other things too and he breaks down humor all the different kinds of it Exaggeration, mispronunciation, um, stereotyping, high humor, po-faced humor, all those kinds of things. And it, like I said, in anybody else's hands, that would be deadly. But I think this is probably going to be wonderful. Uh, it'd be dated because humor dates. And a lot of the humor that he'll be talking about will be, for instance, from the early days of The New Yorker, which will be, in the 21st century, we would call it incredibly sexist, incredibly racist. Uh, but who knows? Maybe not. Uh, his his sentiments his, uh, went well ahead of his day for most of the time, so that, that's going to be a joy. Probably one of the Max Eastman books that I would want to have and own would be this one. Uh, and then the last one we'll finish up here is a rebuy. That's another thing the Brattle allows you to do. They allow you, they just present you with perfect condition copies of books that you had once upon a time and for some reason you don't have. In this case, it's not for some reason. In this case, I know what the reason is. Every time I have a copy of this thing, I give it away. <laughs> Every time I do. I found a perfect condition copy of it. I am hoping that this time I have the sense to keep it. <laughs> this is the mighty Riverside Shakespeare. The second edition, the brown edition, no other edition looks like this. It's got the, uh, the slightly wider aspect to it and the onion skin pages. 
uh, that run throughout. It's got long introductions, great exhaustive notes, and definitive editions of every one of the plays and poems and sonnets here. And the, uh, it's, it is the critical edition of Shakespeare to have. And I know I just got a collected Shakespeare in the mail that one of you sent me. But I, I, as soon as I saw this, I realized, okay, you're in one of those periods where you don't have the Riverside Shakespeare, and you should never be without it. It belongs in this room. I just, probably one of you said, you know, what edition of Shakespeare should I have? And I thought, oh, you should have the Riverside Shakespeare in here. I want you to have it so bad, I'll send it to you. And I probably just grabbed it off the, the shelf in here. It would have been in this room. I'm hoping that I hold on to this, especially since uh, Shake Timber formerly shake tube is right around the corner and we'll be talking about shakespeare all month long uh so there you go that is the uh the brattle uh for today we have the riverside shakespeare the mighty second edition we have enjoyment of laughter by max eastman we have becoming a londoner the diary of david plant we have samuel addis's revolution by cast Hanfield. we have reinventing bach uh and we have the big v a little mass market vietnam novel uh so, not a bad Brattle Hall, not the whole Brattle Hall, half of it, but all the rest of them I'm not showing on camera, so that, that'll do for today, that's fine, <laughs> but uh, who knows when I'll be back to the Brattle, I think we're getting rain for the next three days. I'm not telling you being that, <laughs> she wouldn't be happy with that at all, <laughs> she's pretty happy right now. <laughs> but, uh, she wouldn't be happy if she knew it was going to be raining for three days, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep that to myself, <laughs> but I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.